Monsignor Quinn should be remembered as the person who started the civil rights movement right here in, in the Brooklyn Diocese. Here's a man who understood, identified early in his life as a priest, the need to reach out to African Americans, people of color. He recognized that as a real need in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Father Quinn had a great love of the Lord. And because of his love of the Lord, he loved the African American people because he found Jesus in them. One of his lasting legacies is he's really for us a driving force to promote and defend the rights and equality of all people. He was willing to sacrifice his life as a young priest to serve the marginal. He saw something that was missing and that became his ministry. He was a seed that grew and grew. The seed has reached around the world. Monsignor Bernard Quinn, a priest of the Diocese of Brooklyn, is considered a saint by many. His legacy carries on today in the diocese and in the parish he founded for African-American Catholics. His story begins in Newark, New Jersey, where he was the last of seven children, born to Sarah Bergen Shields and her husband, Bernard W. Quinn. Father Quinn was blessed to have been born on January 15, 1888, on that very same day, Peter Claver, who had been an apostle and a champion for the rights of African slaves in Cartagena, um, Colombia, South America, he was canonized by Pope Leo XIII. In 1929, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was born on January 15th. So I would say that uh, Father Quinn um, certainly is in good company. There's sort of a thread that ties the three of them um, and how appropriate that is because of all of their work in combating racism and promoting human dignity. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God's grace. It's a day in which we're able to celebrate equality justice, peace. His parents uh, were immigrants from, from Ireland, and um, like immigrants at that time, it was very difficult, you know, for them to, um, to raise a family. The father worked as a longshoreman. His mother, she stayed at home taking care of the kids, but they were a devout Catholic family. The Quinn home was a happy one. Bernard loved sports, especially baseball, and is said to have had a friendly and outgoing personality. At St. Michael's School in Newark, Sister Modesta taught him about Jesus and Mary. Serving as an altar boy, he was encouraged by Father William Richmond to enter a prep seminary high school and college. After the death of his father, he transferred to St. Peter's College in Jersey City. From his early years, he was beginning to understand his relationship with Jesus Christ. So he began to spend time in prayer each day. His father had since died, so he had to keep an eye on the family. He had three sisters and his brother Charles. At the end of his studies at St. Peter's College, and he had applied to the seminary, but the Newark Diocese at that time, they weren't able you know, to find a place for him in a seminary. They had reached their numbers and recommended him to apply um, to the Brooklyn Diocese. At St. John's Seminary, he was very involved. He was very social and uh, he was a popular student, but also very uh, prayerful. In the seminary, Bernard was an avid reader of Catholic magazines, which exposed him to a greater vision of the church. He was impressed by the ministry of the Catholic Board for Mission Work among the colored people in the southern states, and found himself gravitating towards black Catholics. On Saturday, June 1, 1912, Bernard Quinn was ordained to the priesthood by Brooklyn Bishop Charles E. MacDonald in the Church of St. John the Baptist in Brooklyn. 
at his ordination. Um, it was an experience where he was just uh, totally, he was totally overwhelmed by the experience. He said that the ceremony itself, he almost was like in a different world <laughs> because for him, the, um, the ordination had sealed his heart with the heart of his Lord. He said that during the sacred ceremony, we had become one. He wrote a letter to the bishop and asked the bishop if it was possible for him you know, to begin a ministry to African Americans. Bishop MacDonald also wanted priests to volunteer as chaplains because with the, um, the beginning of the, the First World War, there was a need um, for chaplains to work, you know, um, among the American soldiers for the spiritual welfare of, of the American soldiers. And Father Quinn volunteered. During the course of World War I, Father Quinn fearlessly ministered to the soldiers in the thick of battle. He was wounded and gassed, sustaining injuries to his lungs. He was, he was right in there with the troops. As a matter of fact, he was gassed at one time. Um, he, he suffered uh, you know, some physical uh, illness over there, and he really carried that for the rest of his life. He was there for anyone who needed him to help them to make that passage, you know, onto the Lord, whether they were Catholic or not Catholic, whether they were Caucasian or African or whatever race. One day while off duty, he visited his army barracks library and chanced upon a book on the life of Sister Therese from Lisieux. He became fascinated by her life and upon finding out that the home of Therese in Alencon was close to his army barracks, he visited and became the first priest to celebrate Mass there. He just became very, very interested as she, you know, described our life. I would say he fell head over heels in fascination with her. He admired her for her simplicity. And, and the fact that she wrote that God really loves us as his dearly beloved children. He went and visited the home of St. Teresa, the little flower. And from that, he said mass at the little flower's house. He developed a great devotion to the little flower, which later came to uh, bore more fruit when he came back to Brooklyn. On June 24, 1919, Father Quinn was discharged from his army chaplain duties and returned home to Brooklyn, where he once again pursued his interest in a mission apostolate to African Americans. He was temporarily stationed at St. James Pro Cathedral, then at Holy Innocent Church, until Bishop MacDonald gave him permission to begin his ministry on May 1, 1920. He felt that he had no other options but to walk the streets of Brooklyn and to inquire among African-Americans whom he met if they knew any black Catholics. My father's mother is from Haiti. That's why we're Catholic. My father's father came from another island called Grenada. His father was a slave in Grenada. My grandfather from Grenada, he worked on the Panama Canal, and he did a lot of work around the islands and in South America before he came to this country, you know, before he decided to move up to New York and, and become a part of this community. Father Quinn had an idea of what was going on when he tried to involve himself with the group called the Colored Catholics of Brooklyn, which was an organization that was started back in 1915 prior to this church. Imitating Jesus, he went in search of his flock. He had encountered um, Jules de Weaver, an immigrant from the Dutch island of Curaçao. He was a very devout Catholic. And so in 1915, he started the Colored Catholic Club of Brooklyn. And it was an organization to organize black Catholics. Once Father Quinn got the okay to establish his parish, they needed a church building. 
He was able to get the Colored Catholic uh, Club members to go on the street begging for uh, donations to the street corners. The bishop did allow him to make an appeal in the Catholic churches. So the pastors allowed him, you know, at the end of masses to speak about the ministry. And he did get the financial support, you know, from the, the churches in the diocese. When enough funds were obtained, Father Quinn received permission from the diocese to buy an old former Protestant church building in Bedford-Stuyvesant. When word got out that this would be a worship space for African Americans, there was tremendous community opposition. To protect their new church building, Father Quinn and his parishioners took turns at night to keep watch. Despite these threats, Father Quinn was undeterred. Back in 1920, May 1st, that Bishop McDonald finally gave the okay for Father Quinn to start this church. But this church itself was built in 1853. So when Father Quinn got a hold of this building to change it into a Catholic church, it took some work. The members of the Colored Catholic Club, for them, their prayers were answered. They'd always prayed that the Lord will send them a shepherd who would embrace their cause. So Father Quinn was the answer to their prayers. He was the shepherd. In their minds, God had sent. On February 26, 1922, the newly ordained Bishop of Brooklyn, Thomas Malloy, dedicated the rebuilt church to St. Peter Claver. At the church's opening was the founder of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, Mother Catherine Drexel, now a saint. She admired the priest's ministry since her own congregation served African and Native Americans. Her sisters eventually came to staff the first parish school. Priests inspired by Father Quinn requested assignments as his associates at St. Peter Claver. A religious community of black religious brothers was established to provide a variety of services. He built St. Peter Claver for the black community that was growing, that was really exploding in the diocese. He wanted them to really encounter Jesus. He wanted them uh, to be able to celebrate the sacraments here. He was a champion of equality, and he wanted just to bring everyone together. St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, began to emerge as a major figure in parish life. On the day of her canonization, Father Quinn began a weekly novena in her honor that attracted Catholics from across the diocese. People had sought the aid of the Little Flower Shrine at St. Peter Claver Church. The novena, he was thinking about it for a long time because he had been at her house, he had began to see that he needed to share that spiritual relationship with his people when he went back. So now you had a lot of white Catholics that started to come. And Father Quinn also found himself ministering to the white Catholics. Father Quinn welcomed them. And they, 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 they told him the reason why they went there. And he was very sympathetic. And they found him to be a very loving and caring priest. By 1938, Membership at St. Peter Claver had risen to 4,800 parishioners. Father Quinn set up parish stations throughout Brooklyn where it was easier for people to attend Sunday Mass. In recognition of the pioneering work he was doing, Father Quinn was made a Monsignor, but he wanted people to continue to address him as Father. One of the great accomplishments in the parish was the building of a multi-purpose parish institute which was comprised of a school, convent, basketball gym and entertainment hall, night school for black adults lacking basic education, meeting rooms, basement bowling lanes, shower rooms, and a medical clinic, where a doctor volunteered his services to residents in the community. So he saw that there was a need um, for a sports center. 
and also there was a need to provide medical care. So he envisioned a building that would encompass school, sports center, medical clinic, a medical clinic. It would serve different functions. And so that's how the, the, the institute really came about. Um, a building that would serve and provide for many services of the community. And uh, he opened it up as a community center. And it was, it was really the source of a lot of social life here in Bedford-Stuyvesant, for, particularly for black Catholics. The great black actress, Lena Horne, sang some of her first songs over there in St. Peter Claver Hall. She was very active over here. And there were some other popular singers who started their careers right here at St. Peter Claver. So it was a place for, for a lot of social gatherings for black Catholics. They had a place of their own they could come to. Father Quinn's crowning achievement was his erection of the Little Flower House of Providence Orphanage for black children in Wading River, Long Island. Just as he faced opposition in the creation of St. Peter Claver Church, Father Quinn faced opposition here as well. The Ku Klux Klan burned the first orphanage house and farmhouse to the ground. In response, Father Quinn had a second home erected in 1929. Again, the KKK destroyed the incomplete structure by fire. Father Quinn defied the Klan, placing his life in the hands of St. Therese. Eventually, a sturdy brick orphanage building was completed. When the Ku Klux Klan burnt it down the first time, he was so infuriated, and he got some of them and said to them, what are you doing? You know, what is this about? And so um, they said, well, what is this love for African-Americans and Caribbean people? And he said, they have the soul of Christ. For him, it was the best possible place for black kids. He, he stuck, you know, to his principle. He was not doing anything illegal. And why should he cower to the Ku Klux Klan, you know, it was just filled with, with a lot of hatred against blacks and against um, Catholics at that particular time. And so he stood up very bravely, you could say, to the Klan and, and saying to them, I am not going anywhere else. I am remaining here in Wayne and River. The orphanage will be established here. So there was, a, you, could, you could say, head-to-head -head confrontation, you know, between themselves and him. And so they threatened his life and they said that, you know, he might be responsible for whatever that happened to him. And he said, well, do what you want to do. He was not moving. He continued to, to really stand up to the hatred of the KKK and really just was able to continue the mission of, of what he was called to do, uh, to really bring the light and love of Christ to the African-American community, to the black community. In 1940, Father Quinn, only 52 years of age, fell ill with an intestinal tumor. He was admitted on April 7, 1940 into St. Mary's Hospital in Brooklyn where he died following surgery. An estimated 8,000 people attended his funeral at St. Peter Claver Church. They stood reverently around the block of the church, which was only able to accommodate a few hundred indoors. The New York Times the following day declared that Father Quinn was a champion of Negro rights. Many political, civil, and judicial figures attended the funeral to give testimony to the heroic and unprecedented work that he had done. Today, Catholics in Brooklyn still speak with reverence about Father Quinn. He's dedicated his life to make a difference. And some even attribute answers to their prayers as a result of his intercession. Monsignor Quinn is buried out at St. Bridget Cemetery in Westbury, which um, is connected to Holy Rood Cemetery. I would pray that maybe as a priest I might have that same love that he displayed, that passionate love for the people he served. I would pray for the courage to be able to stand up when people's rights are trampled upon. I pray that through his intercession, I might be able to be creative in reaching out to people to share with them the love of God and the richness of God's grace.
We still feel so many, many tensions here uh, racially. And Monsignor Quinn is really a saint for our time to show people uh, the way to racial harmony. And it's important that we all work together, that we're all human beings and that we're all co-equal members of the church. He didn't minister to African Americans or people of color. He ministered to us all. Uh, he ministered to us all by drawing us all in to recognize that no one should be excluded from the proclamation of the gospel. And my own testimony of faith uh, comes from when I uh, had my open heart surgery. And, uh, it's now uh, 15 years ago almost. I had to put a filter in because I had blood clots in my heart and in my lungs. And all during the time I was waiting, all I could think about was Monsignor Quinn. I was recuperating and so there wasn't any reason why I would have had him in mind. But I did feel his presence that day. I was silently praying to him. And so that's my testimony of faith of how Monsignor Quinn interceded for me at a very critical time in my life when I could have died at any minute. He was a holy man and a saint before we ever started the course because he was willing to sacrifice his life as a young priest to serve the marginal and the people that society and the church did not give attention to as they were supposed to. He saw something that was missing within the church at that time, and that became his ministry. Father Quinn wanted those who were marginalized because of their black skin to find a place in his heart along with white immigrants. To see Monsignor Quinn as a saint would be a very good thing for the people here. The church itself, it's always going to be here. The history is something that doesn't stop. St. Peter Claver is black Catholic history. And as long as we keep this place going, as long as we keep people coming here, to me is a big thing. We finished, uh, actually, the first stage is where he's declared a servant of God. The diocesan bishop can do that with consultation with the Holy See, with the office for the canonization of saints. And the second phase is to prepare documents and any research we can do on his life. And that's been sent over now perhaps a year ago. Now we're waiting for a response back, which will move him to the second stage which would make him venerable. And the next stage would be blessed. To be a blessed, you need a miracle. And so we all already are collecting testimony from people who have prayed to him and feel that they have received uh, some type of uh, favor. Favors are one thing, miracles are something else. And we're waiting uh, for that. I think his legacy is social justice. And that's why I really would like to see him become a saint. Our world is in turmoil, trying to figure out how we should treat each other. And he took care of the elderly, he took care of everybody in his parish. We need that in our society. We need a hero, we need a person that was willing to put his life out there when he could have done lots of other things. He was always a priest who loved the Lord and saw the Lord in African-American people and the white Catholics. But spiritually, I think the heart of Father Quinn was the love that he had for Jesus. He said that he was willing to shed the last drop of his life's blood. Any person that says that they would be willing to shed the last drop of their life's blood has to be a saint.